Today we are doing the Q&A with our usual creative we director. Sorry. Yes, you lost me for a second. So tonight we are doing our usual with creative director Chris Joppa Perkins and we've got Ben Dean here. Hey guys. And we will be answering your questions that I have gathered throughout the month. A lot of questions. But first, I would like if you could, Sir Joppa, um, give us a little general update on what's been going on in Dev for the past month and maybe an update on that pesky Persist. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I mean, Persist has really been the main thing that's been going on. I do want to clear up what I feel like is a bit of a misconception, though, and that is that we've been trying to fix Persist. That's maybe technically true. Um, however, the, the reality is uh, the persistence um, infrastructure and kind of the whole uh, setup for persistence is, or I should say was, our kind of our final vestige of like legacy um, in, in code uh, back from literally the, the inception of the project and what was initially set up back at the beginning. So. It, we've not really been fixing persist. We've been um, creating our intended persistence layer. And what, what's been taking time is not finishing that, but hooking everything up to that and kind of plumbing and piping everything through that new persistence layer. So um, really happy to report that that is, for all intents and purposes, that's that's finished. And a lot of the piping and hooking up is finished. We've just started uh, testing that internally this week. Um, we had hoped actually to get the first candidate out um, this weekend, and we're going to end up pushing that back just a little bit more um, to fix a few things that we found in internal testing that will just make you know the experience much more seamless. But we are right on the verge of having that back, and with that comes a return to our our cadence with our our prod pushes, and we've got a ton of. Uh, stuff coming out with this next patch as well that's just been <laughs> building up um, because obviously we've continued working on on everything during the process of, of getting the persistence updated so and we'll get into a good bit of that as we go along tonight so is that is that the last of the sort of legacy code that we have and is it just clear sailing from here or clear sailing as far as old code goes yes yeah that that's that is the last of the old um stuff that we've needed to gut and update it doesn't mean that you know we don't have upcoming things that we're going to be working on things like um you know the game systems that are still needing to be put into place um some of our our zone crossing uh, you know, we do still need to do some work on that, but this is the last thing that's going to be like, we need to freeze and fix this and kind of overhaul this before we can keep moving forward. The, the game engine and all of its supporting parts are pretty darn stable now. And, uh, we're, uh, we're running on launch tech now. So it's really, 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 really big deal. Um, but dev has still been deving, right? I mean, everything's still, everyone's working, everyone's yeah, getting stuff done. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so let's get on to a couple of the starting questions. Let's start with bindstones. Will they be a thing in Pantheon? And if so, how will they work? They will be, they are a thing in Pantheon. Uh, they function essentially as alternative, uh, an alternative bind mechanic for personal use. Um, so when you don't have access to a class that can bind you in additional locations, I should add. So the, the classes that are able to bind uh, are going to be able to bind in some additional locations and and some more, uh, you should say, like, I guess, convenient locations. But when it comes to personal binding, these this is what bindstones, uh, the purpose they serve. So in each zone, there's typically going to be two to three bindstones placed in various parts of the zone, the, the much larger zones, something like Avengers Pass, for example, would probably have three in total, whereas smaller zones might have two or even one. 
Um, you can also plan on there being one usually near like a large village or a town or a city, something like that. And uh, simply clicking on one of those will bind you to that stone. That will become your character's respawn point when you die. The location you'll return to when you use like a gate spell or an origin spell. Um, and this is a planned feature. Like this is this is purposed and intended as a release feature functionality for the game. That's very cool. That's that's been a topic recently, and I did um, I did post a image of a bind stone in one of the Pantheon channels. So if you guys can go hunt it down, you can find it. Um, so another big topic has been the death penalty. Uh, since the alpha pledge sessions, there's been a lot of talk on the death penalty, whether or not it's fair or not fair. Are there any plans to tweak this system? Um, is this is the death penalty what it is now? What we can see, what we can plan on seeing at launch? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a big topic. Um, are there any plans to tweak the system? Uh, yes, in the sense that there are likely going to be tweaks to things like the amount of experience that you lose at death. We'll continue to dial that in. We're we're keeping an eye on the near death state and. We want to make sure that it provides the appropriate amount of, of risk and opportunity. You know, we want it to be reasonable for someone to actually bring you, bring a, a downed player back into the action. Um, but we also want it to be risky enough that that's not like a foregone conclusion or a guarantee. So it, it, in those, as it, as it relates to those things, yes, there will be ongoing tweaks. But the system, in terms of its general shape, um, what you see now is what we intend to launch with, yes. So we intend for death to be punishing. Yes. Are there any plans for healers to be able to res themselves? Um, the shaman will actually have uh, an ability that will allow them to self-res, but that's something that is pretty unique to the shaman. Um, it's not that I'm opposed to the other two healers not having something like that, but it would be more of a prestige kind of epic level ability for those classes, whereas the Shaman, it would be much more of a natural um, part of their kit. Very cool. Um, will we get a command in game to give other players consent to retrieve a corpse? Yes, you will have a command to drag another player's corpse uh not loot it but to drag it yes which i i i believe that that's already in is it really i can just run around with other people's corpses uh, it's not. looks like it's it's not actually functioning properly so it's it's there i mean the hook is there for the command seems like it's just broken okay well that can get fixed. Yay. How do you see non-primary stats impacting character classes? Like, will be will warriors be able to utilize intelligence in any meaningful way? Yeah, so the, the role that non-primary stats are going to play, something I've referred to as, like, soft specking before, and that is... Uh, just about every ability that you have um, has uh, modifiers on it, stat modifiers on it, that will, over time, it's, it's, it's a very simplistic implementation right now, but over time, there will be certain parameters and aspects of your abilities that will be additionally impacted by directly by specific stats. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, a, an attack might be impacted by your strength um, or your agility or your dexterity, the damage that you deal based on the class that you play and just um, how strength factors into your attack power or dexterity factors into your attack power, what have you. Th there's that, but then a specific attack, let's say, might have a uh, might have like a, a component to it or an effect to it that reduces the target's armor class. And that modifier, let's say dexterity in this case, or um, something even like intelligence or charisma or wisdom, depending on the ability, might exist as an, like an additional layer 
that further pushes the effectiveness of that secondary effect. So a warrior, for example, um, might have an ability with a secondary effect that is amplified by intelligence or amplified by wisdom. And the, the goal of that is to make the effects subtle enough, but also, you know, try and balance them in a way where um, you can lean into pushing the effectiveness of certain abilities that you have even more so by how you itemize yourself. And so if you see, you know, a piece of gear drop that has intelligence on it as a warrior, you might typically overlook that. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, it would be cool to have a set of gear that actually does have some intelligent intelligence on it so that I can really lean into maximizing these secondary effects in certain situations. That just adds another layer to character customization. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about the perception system last time, um, and you had some things to say about that. Uh, what people want to know, what, what do you see the feature looking like at launch? If you could have it your way, how, how would this look? And what do you think we'll be able to do with the team that we have? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really what it boils down to is um, us taking a look at the systems that we have, that we intend, that we want. And then what does it actually look like resource wise, time frame wise to get them in and flesh them out as much as we want. And then, of course, you factor in, are we talking by launch? Are we talking post launch and giving ourselves the freedom? to uh, to allow certain systems or aspects of systems to roll into a post-launch category as as needed. Um, so perception is an interesting one because perception is a it's a core system. I mean, I don't I don't think anybody that's familiar with Pantheon isn't familiar with you know what perception is and how it's meant to really differentiate Pantheon from. Uh, you know, really uh, several other MMO experiences that you can go and have. And, and differentiators are meant to be a sum is greater than the parts kind of thing. You know, one differentiator doesn't mean as much as a set of differentiators that really set the experience apart. And so um, perception is one of those things. It's part of a, a group of other differentiators, but it's, it's a key system. So we're taking the inclusion of it seriously. And the comments that I've made pre recently I, I, I hope that the communication or the takeaway from that is, is not that perception is not seen as an important system or something that we're looking at, at finding any way that we can, you know, to make sure that it's implemented as fully as possible um, in time for launch and then, you know, only relegating what we're not going to be able to get done by then until a post-launch state. So just to break it down a little bit, um, the perception, it, it, it's, it's kind of, you should think of it in three parts, essentially. It's a system made up of three main parts. And the first part is the discovery aspect of it. And that includes things like lore pings, interactable objects, things to actually discover in the environment. So, um, and that would also include the flagging aspect of perception, which you probably heard me talk about ad nauseum, where when you do something like that, when you, when you trigger a, a lore ping, which is that little message you see uh, at the top of the screen, or you interact with an object in the environment, um, or you talk to a certain NPC or, or any other set of events that you could do, th this flags you and it gives you a persistent flag that that goes with you through the rest of your character's journey. And, and we can uh, riff on that flag um, in any other interaction that you do, be it with an NPC or an object or anything else, to unlock specific things for you because you have that flag active. So that it's a really big piece of the perception system and it creates a real sense of discovery and, and meaningfulness to your journeying and you're your looking for things and interacting with things. And that one's probably the lowest hanging through, fruit part of the system that we're you know, going to be keeping up with and, and making sure we're factoring into our development cycle along the way. The, the second part of the perception system is the narrative aspect. And this is actually building out the storyline content. This is having deeper in NPC interactions where you see the branching dialogue and the different decisions that can be made. And this is a huge part of like deepening the immersive aspect of the world, giving our NPCs and our locations a whole lot of character and nuance and, and context 
Um, and this one is is the one that is also the most resource intensive. Um, this is the one where you have to have a lot of people contributing to the narrative, the writing, the, the content of these various things. And uh, this is one where, you know, it's kind of up in the air right now how far we're going to be able to take that. And it's heavily dependent on resource, heavily dependent on staff. Um, and we're going to be kind of, you know, making decisions on that as we go along. The third aspect is the progression piece. And that's where you can actually progress as a keeper, making you more capable of, you know, delving deeper into the first two parts. That one also is something that we can, <coughs> I think we can get in much more reasonably and, and um, viably uh, and connect it to the first part where you can get better at finding things in the environment or better at, you know, discovering things and um, whatnot. So again, the, that's kind of a breakdown of the three parts. Um, it's too early at this stage to say, you know, all three are going to be in by launch or um, only this one or only these two. Um, but it, it, the goal and what I'm saying is to emphasize that it's, it's a vital system to the game. And we're looking, we're actually exploring some options even right now of how we can um, scale up and ramp up the process of, of developing those three sides of it. And we'll just kind of keep everybody posted as we go along. That's a pretty good breakdown. Um, I mean, is there any, will, will players be seeing anytime soon uh, more lore and more story and more quests? Is that a plan to go in game at any point in the near future? Yeah, yes, for sure. Uh, so the, as early as the next patch, you're going to start seeing a lot of that being folded back into the game experience. So this is interacting with NPCs, for example. And I would encourage everyone who plays once you know this next patch gets pushed, spend some time talking to the NPCs. Um, they have a variety of different things that they could say, uh, and sometimes it takes a little bit of you know talking to them to actually uncover some of those additional things that they can say. And then, as I said, as we start you know layering back in the perception system, which is something since um, since the refactor that we did uh, and, and kind of some of the various, you know, revisiting of the systems that we've done that we've had to unplug um, for a period of time, all the data is still there. You know, everything that we set up for those is still there, but getting it piped back in is something that we're in the process of doing over the next few months. Um, and then uh, continuing on from there, you know, as we move into new zones and new areas, if we're talking about publicly released lore, uh, I think you should probably start expecting more of that once we do start getting into some actual new areas um, in development and as we start talking about them more publicly to get more lore out in front of you all that you haven't seen before, areas that you haven't really gotten to peer into that that deeply before. So definitely expect it to be on the horizon. Oh, that's so fun. Okay, so um, speaking of upcoming additions to the game... Um, Avengers Pass, that's currently being worked on. Um, the content, will it will it be able to take a player to level 30 or will it just function as an alternative play area to Throne Fast, which currently basically takes a player to level 20? It, it's going to feel much more like a natural flow zone from Throne Fast. Um, the, the world is, is massive. And I mean, when you when you guys all get back into Avengers Paths, you're going to quickly remember slash realize how massive the area is, especially now in that open world sense. And because it is a very open world sense or open world approach to our game design or world design, um, you're going to start seeing some changes in terms of the level range and how Throne Fast is meant to much more naturally flow into Avengers Pass. Um, something that we're trying to stay away from is um, what I guess in some circles is, is called concentric circles of content, where you have you know, this area, you've got your level 5 to 10 stuff, and then that connects to this area, which is your level 10 to 15 stuff, and that connects to this area, which is your level 15 to 20 stuff. And it's a very linear kind of concentric handoff set of circles that leads you into the next uh, level area. We, you should expect a much more broad and gradual 
increase of level range, more so than you're used to. What that means is that the level range, general core level range of Throne Fast is going to be and has been reduced slightly. So you're no longer going to be getting up to level 20 in Throne Fast, um, at least, you know, not in like any kind of uh, well-trodden path to do so. Um, and so you're, the, the hope is, is that we're going to see players moving into Avengers Pass much more quickly as just an alternative place to move through those, you know, level 5 to 10, 5 to 12, 5 to 14 um, level range. So you're, you're no longer going to be doing that all in Throne Fast. And then with that, hand in hand with that, is how itemization ultimately incentivizes the flow of players. And so even though some of the level ranges may be coming down in Throne Fast, um, the itemization is still going to be a big part of the decision making you do, which is, do we go down into the Goblin Caves because these items we know drop there or these quests are completed there? Um, do we head to, you know, head to the Haunted Spirit Manor to uh, do this, that, and the other? Um, do we spend time you know, working through uh, you know, some of the Gadai camps, the lower level Gadai camps, or do we move into AVP and start pressing further into that zone. The, the, what I will say, though, is that AVP will ultimately, in regards to its core population, will allow players to level up further now than Throne Fast will. Um, but then uh, the highest level kind of overland population of AVP tops out now at around level 14. Um, and those level 14s are you know, scattered around other level 12, 13 uh, mobs as well. So the overall level range of AVP has gone down. And that's that's just to start making room for the fact that we're, you know, on the relatively near horizon going to be moving into zones like Black Rose Keep, Eastern Plains, Silent Plains. And as the world continues to grow, the speed at which these levels increase um, is going to need to reduce to naturally kind of help players spread out and move out into more of the world to keep advancing their characters. Um, both Mad Run and Hangor do still and are, you know, currently in various stages of development as well. Um, mm -hmm. Those will be coming online, and those will be much more like destination locations now. Instead of like, oh, I'm just naturally leveled up to the point where I can flow right into Hangor or Mad Run, you're going to have to really spend some time um, getting to the appropriate level to break into that zone, uh, and that will become even more so the case once Eastern Plains, Silent Plains, and Black Rose Keep are online to where you may even have to, you know, leave Avengers Pass um, or focus on very specific parts of Avengers Pass to get high enough level to actually go into Hangor, go into Mad Run, which will be starting around the level 20 uh, point. That's great. So this isn't a situation where you're going to level in one area, move to another area, then move to another area. You're going to be bouncing around to various content and various areas um to utilize the mobs to level up it's it's not just it's not just you know yeah yeah i love that that's great yeah we've we've had a situation in throne fast because it's largely been the, the primary zone where we've needed level ranges that allow players to get you know to a certain level for testing purposes data and all that but as more of the world comes online, you're going to see us start to adjust the level ranges of these areas to make sure that the, the world needs to be traversed much more so than a single zone or even a handful of zones um, for you to, to find the content that you need to continue progressing your character's level. But then also knowing that itemization is going to play a huge role as well in terms of where players are moving to and um, what options they have at various levels. That's fantastic. Okay, so you talked a little bit about um, capital cities and that we may have to launch without accessible capital cities. Um, how likely is it that we will not see these areas at launch? And um, how will Pantheon create iconic racial starting areas without them? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's still too early to say whether we will or won't be able to realize the capital cities. Um, that's It's just not answerable right now because uh, what it comes down to ultimately is development resources and dev time. And I know, I'm aware 
that there's very strong sentiment in the community that falls on both sides of this. Some people would say capital cities, starting cities are paramount. They're critical. They can't not have them. Um, and then other people that would say, you know, I'd much rather have an adventure area or, you know, another big part of a zone fleshed out where, you know, I'm more consistently going and doing content and having uh, content uh, to engage with. Um, and and I kind of I kind of fall on both sides. I mean, it's ancient history now, but back at the beginning of this project, the plan was not to have starting cities. The plan was to have um, uh, basically three common areas on each of the continents that you could choose to start in, and anybody could choose to start there. Um, and I fought really hard for there to be capital cities for all of the races. Um, and w a big part of the pushback even back then was how resource intensive they are compared to how much content you actually get out of them. And uh, one of the goals back then was to come up with as many compelling ways to keep starting cities fresh and meaningful content wise to justify putting the time and the resources in them. And I remember Brad, for example, was a huge, he, he was very against starting cities after Vanguard specifically because of him recounting how long New Targonor took to build, how massive it was and how empty it was. And in retrospect, how much time and resource was spent on New Targonor versus what it actually did in the world. Um, so it was a really, good conversation, lots of back and forth there. And and where we've landed ultimately, again, the reality is there is constraint on what we can do based on time, resources, staff, etc. And where we where we put resources matters so much. Um, and what I the way I would answer the question ultimately is I do still believe though, even if even if the largest of the starting cities like Thronefast, like Kadasa, um, possibly even Fairthail, the city itself. Um, the the cities that are, are much more asset intensive and, and just massive in scale in general, even if we do have to wait to a post-launch to open up those cities, I do still firmly believe that we can capture the smaller cities as they're planned much more easily. And I think those are much more likely to be in place. And then if we have to do kind of an exterior starting area for something like Throne Fast or something like Kadasa, et cetera, that we can still and are still, like with Avelia as an example, we're still making them enough in a, in a style with enough of the city itself, even just in view, to still lend that racial identity to the races. And I think that'll become more clear as we get more of these racial starting areas online. I mean, the Havlings, for example, have... Sorhirith, they have their tree city, and that's that's done because it was much more manageable asset wise. And things like Scargol and Broken Maw, probably to a large degree, um, and Suroa for the Archai, like uh, those places are going to be much easier to develop than something like you know Throne Fast and all of its intended grandeur. And then you could also say, and I, and I am saying that there, it's possible that you know, some kind of compromise we can reach there, depending on those resource constraints, where some part of Throne Fast is available, but not all of it. So it's just still too early to say at this stage. But I, I don't think that regardless of how it shakes out, that it's going to force us to compromise racial identity, which is at the heart of, you know, what these things are about anyway. Yeah, and I, I think that Avelia is actually doing a pretty good job of, um, of being a city hub type deal. Um, People gather there. People look for buffs there. Um, is there any is there any plan to to flesh out Avalia just a little bit more and make it feel more lived in? Yeah, th but that's that's the same thing could be said about the world in general. And part of our approach, our development approach, is is approaching these things in phases. Um, right now, our emphasis is on breadth. It's on coverage. We want to bring more of the world online. We want there to be more places that you can go, more things that you can do. And then we plan on having a second pass. And eventually, ideally, the hope is a second team, kind of a, a second uh, world building dev team that can focus on that uh, polish pass, that can focus on coming through these areas and placing all the spider webs and the, the pots and the crates and uh, 
you know, having the the dancing minstrel, you know, playing the bard playing his lute and some NPCs kind of standing around clapping to the tune and, you know, these kinds of moments that that would come in in the second pass as we sweep through because um, making sure these places feel lived in and that there's enough detail to make them interesting is really important. Yeah. Yeah, those those are important, and that that would be great to see. How are we feeling about the new art style? Um, is what we're seeing in game now a reasonable demonstration of where we think that art will be at launch? Yeah, I, the, I mean the overall style shift. We're we're absolutely happy with it in terms of you know its its development implications and uh, kind of the promise of what we're going to be able to achieve. Um, Compared to what the previous art style was on the whole, I, I would say unanimously we are happy with with the shift. But but I can say at the same time it's not there yet. Like it's going to continue to evolve. It's going to continue to improve. And one example I can give is with lighting. Um, very soon we're going to be doing another pass on lighting because our goal is to try to land somewhere more in between the current stylization and a bit more realism. So. Essentially, we want what we want to try to achieve is a solid hybrid between stylized and realistic. That's our ultimate goal. And a lot of what we've been able to accomplish in our stylization is dramatically reducing poly counts, dramatically reducing you know texture sizes, and um, you know a lot of the the kind of uh, density of world detail needed to support the realism. But where we are right now is lacking a lot of just just enough of that realism that comes through primarily the lighting to give the world more depth to kind of anchor it and make it feel a little bit less um, cartoony. And so that's going to be the next major step that we're making in terms of the overall aesthetic. Um, that's going to, uh, you know, kind of play into a lot of other things as well with player lighting and shadows and things I think that are going to be uh, major improvements and step forwards, uh, steps forward to what we have right now. Is the dark dark going to stay dark? Not as dark as it is currently, no. Um, no. And that's part of what we'll be addressing in the upcoming lighting pass, um, again, as well as revisiting the, the player light sources, the aesthetics of those, the efficacy of those. Um, but yeah, it's, it's too dark right now. And I think a lot of the tension and the moodiness that we want in nighttime, we can achieve and still let people see. Um, and that, and that also leaves us the opportunity to make it super, super, super dark in certain specific places and locations where we want to. Um, but when we're looking at just the overall level of brightness and, and visibility at nighttime, it is not where we want it to be right now. It's too dark. Yeah. So it would make sense to have the overland areas a little bit lighter and then the dungeon areas dark, dark. Yeah, well, the dungeon area is not so much dark, dark necessarily, because dungeon areas can still be well lit and be very moody, but just have really dark recesses and shadowy areas. But then sections of dungeons, sections of places under the world, under the ground where you're crawling through and moving through, where, yeah, maybe the torch has been knocked over and there's there's an extended section where it's really, really dark. And all of a sudden, those places, light sources become very important. But then that's also needs to be balanced between the availability and the efficacy of player light sources. So the, the hope is that uh, by uplifting the overall brightness and visibility of nighttime in general, that it will be less of a an issue for players currently because the light sources currently are pretty they're pretty useless um, in, <laughs> in terms of how, how bright they are. Um, they can they can. But a lot of the reason for that is because we're having to balance for when you get six players in a cave area and all of them have light sources, then it, it just blows it out and completely eliminates darkness in any degree. So part of the upcoming lighting pass as well is going to be doing some code work to limit how many player lights can be visible on your specific client at the same time. So you know, you're you're getting the benefit of your light source and within certain range, you're getting the benefit of other players' light sources, but it's not so much that it's just completely blowing everything out. Um, so we're going to be finessing a lot of that in place as well. Um, but we do we do still want there to be places where darkness is really dark. And uh, 
but utilize that more as kind of curated moments in specific places and not everywhere at all times. That makes sense. That's fantastic. So how has the new art helped performance? I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I would imagine for the game, for the team, um, what, are, what, what benefits are we seeing, seeing from the new art? Well, I mentioned a couple just now. The, the, we have our poly counts overall have been reduced, uh, both player characters, NPCs, world objects. We've been able to go with a just a, a lower poly count in what we make. And so there's just less draw claw, calls, less rendering load that you're having to do. So that's been a big performance gain. Um, I think it's also helped streamline and simplify the uh, asset creation process because we've been able to really get behind a unified style guide, kind of an art Bible, if you will, where our artists understand you know, exactly kind of the hand-painted uh, look we're going for, how to handle the normal maps, how to handle the you know the different maps that that we're using, and those um, those maps also being smaller. So instead of needing to use like 4K texture resolution maps, we're able to now use uh, you know 1K or maybe 2K at the most. And so the amount of memory that's being saved on just texture memory is also noticeable and not insignificant. Um, so there's definitely very legitimate you know performance-wise gains that we've made on this front, uh, not to mention just the kind of the, the speed of, of the development of, you know, the various art pieces has improved quite a bit without the, uh, the extra, uh, I don't know necessarily the right word for it. Um, the complexities that come with creating, you know, photorealistic or, you know, uh, genuinely realistic, physically based rendering objects. <sighs> Definitely. Um, stream week. That was a lot of fun for us. We saw a lot of streams happening and the fans really enjoyed it. Content creators really stepped up and showed a lot of the game. Um, will we be holding these in the future and setting any sort of cadence for them? Ben, I hope you're paying attention. Yeah, I, I, I counted 88 streams and or content from there and I'm sure I didn't catch them all. Um, Sort of answered, yes, definitely. Definitely want to do it again. When? I don't know. Um, we do, the our considerations are things like performance and, and that sort of thing. Um, but yes, definitely, definitely, definitely coming. We'll let you know as soon as I do. Yeah, that was, that. it was great. I loved having all those streams happening. It was, it was actually pretty difficult to try to hop between them and keep up with everything that was going on. Uh, what about future Alpha Pledge sessions, Sir Sir Dean? Uh, I, I I can't answer that any better than anybody else on the team right now. Um, yes, we want to do it more, and yes, we will be doing it more. Um, I think the 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 heart of that question is when, and I I just don't have an answer to that. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Uh, how, how did the last Alpha Pledge session go? Did was it a success? Success? Did did we see as a, as a success? Hack out your tongue? No, it's yeah, tongue that's, twister. Yeah, that's that's a word. Well, I'll tell it from 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 my vantage point, and and Chris, I'm sure will will we'll have um, his his thoughts on it too, but. I personally thought it was it was a good success, uh, quite a good success. We did see a lot of activity. We saw um, a lot of people talking and coming back to Pantheon, getting interested in Pantheon again. So from that respect, it was definitely a success. <laughs> Our survey came back with some some good, uh, some great information actually. Um, highlighted some areas that we need to work on, but also highlighted areas that we're doing better than we thought we were doing. Um, Overall, you know, people seem to enjoy the game. Um, it's, so it's, yeah, we got a lot of good information. I think it was a success. Chris? <laughs> sorry, think, I was... I I'm was... sorry. No, no, no. Ben said <laughs> oh, that was, like three or four chat. times <laughs> just to show that it can be said properly and, and Joppa's just being mean. Okay, go uh, ahead. Was go ahead, Joppa. Go I'm ahead, Joppa. No, it I'm was hurt. great. It was great. You're, I know you're not hurt. See, that's why I can do that kind of stuff. I know, I know you're not. Um, no, no soul. 
Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I, I, I am like jonesing to get um, our alphas back in, and uh, we're we're actively looking at when to do that, and um, and maybe more importantly, like how to do it in a way that we can do it rhythmically, so that it's not a question mark all the time, but more something that uh, you guys can actually start looking forward to and knowing when it'll happen. Yeah, for a community, it was freaking fantastic. That's, I mean, having everybody in and having so many people playing, it was so much fun. I, I, I know Joppa was, I was hopping between servers to see how everybody was doing and it was great. All right, what's up next? So in the last Rob, producers... Rob, you, you know what my armor class is, Rob. Come on now. Let me be... What? What class do you play, be... Joppa? Are you playing the shaman? Do you have that shaman in, GM In Pantheon gear? or in real life? <laughs> in Pantheon. I noticed mm. that there's a shaman GM gear that I'm just absolutely jealous of, and I need some on my monk. I, I'm a cleric main... Uh, pretty much in anything that's most like most like a cleric across the games that I play. And then I, I play a monk and a bard usually um, as secondary characters, but almost always in all cases a cleric. Now, how do you pay attention well enough to not kill people? I just do. <laughs> oh. Good to know you can do it somewhere. Yeah. Hey, 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 whoa, nice, okay, okay. It's, I feel like I'm gonna pay for that later. Okay, yeah. so. No, that was a good one, I like that one. In the last producer's letter, Chris Rowan, our CEO, talked about VR working on better communication. Um, can we share how we intend to hit this goal? Do you wanna talk about that, Ben, or shall I? I think you've got uh, you've got some really good points to make in there. Um, so, go yeah, for I made it. it. I made a I list. Made yeah, you did. I like that list too. So, number one, frequent updates. Even if it's just to say we are still working and listening. Number two, we've got the production tracker added to the website to keep the greater community uh, in the loop, and that's the community that may not be on Discord every day or on the forums every day. We want you to have a place where you can go and see updates. Um, we've added to the Sacred Servanthood, which has, which was formerly the mod program. Um, I've add, added people there to help gather questions and spread official messaging. So you should listen to them. They know things. We've got the new Dean's Beans channel on Discord to track when the devs share info and make that info easier to find. So if you don't come here on a regular list, uh, on a regular basis, then you should. Um, and we have a direct line between our project manager, shout out to Rob, and comms to keep info freely moving between our departments. And that has really helped in getting us the information that we need to share with the community. And we've kind of, we've, we have a little channel and everything now so that we can streamline that stuff. So if you guys want to know stuff, you should bug Rob. Ah. I'm kidding. Don't do that. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo that. I mean, Rob's been, been a great help there. I mean, Chris always has been, but uh, having Rob in there as well, it gives us uh, it gives us um, more, I shouldn't say more, but uh, a, a wider variety of, of access and knowledge that we can, that we can share. So it's been, it's been fantastic. And uh, you're being a lot more, you're being too kind, man. He's, he's a lot better at it than I am. And it also, uh, <laughs> Come on. It gives me a chance to focus on other things. But who is Rob again? Yeah, no. So, yeah, that one guy. That one guy who gives us schedules. Uh -huh. Oh, but it... it Robert... Just kidding, Rob. He, he has freed up your ability to create, I think, Chris. Oh, my gosh, yes. Oh, it's... It's it's been amazing. Yeah, it's... Trying to... to do project management and creative direction at the same time is um it's probably why i will not live as long 
uh, anywhere nearly as long as I would have otherwise. So I, I am very thankful for Rob and also that he's so good at it. He is good at it. He's scary good at it. But yeah, it's it's nice to see that everybody has room to do what they're strong at. And I think that you, Chris, are amazing as a creative director. And it's just nice to have you be able to just let that creativity flow and not have to worry about silly things like timelines and deadlines. 100%. I mean, I still have to worry about deadlines. I just yeah, don't have to worry yeah, about I get that. whipping everybody. <laughs> yeah. We'll leave Rob to do that. Rob does the whipping. <clears throat> okay, so when can we start allocating uh, stat increases ourselves on our characters? Joppa. Uh, when that is officially decided as something that we're going to do, and then when that actually comes into play. But I would say, generally speaking, fine detail additions like that are going to come after major additions like getting all the classes implemented and getting their core kits in place i would i would chalk that up since it's already working um it's just a a tweak to the way that it currently works to allow players to have more kind of uh, ownership over that it's something that is not a priority at the moment but it, but it is something and just to reiterate I, I want to explore that i like that myself i would enjoy that myself um, so it's just still to calm down the road. Yeah. Some of us like to control our characters a little bit more. So having those would be pretty cool. Yeah. So currently, uh, resurrecting only works before a player releases. Is there any plans to allow for somebody to resurrect after release? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. And yes. How's that yep, going to work? We'll have We'll have some more info on that soon. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to be working with Kyle here in the next. Uh, uh, mm, I don't know when actually we're going to connect on that, but we're going to be revisiting resurrection in general, how it in interacts with kind of a pre-release state, a post-release state of the, of the corpse, um, how it interacts with the near death, how things like battle reses dif differ from, you know, non-battle reses. Uh, we're going to be getting a lot of that cleaned up. So it should be a lot more clear our intentions at that stage. Now, this is probably the most important question of this Q&A, but um, when will we get a store and when will it include uh, body pillowcases with your face on it, Joppa? Please tell me you saw that, the body pillowcase with your face on it. What would you say if I said I did not see that? Oh, how could you? How could you? How would you, how would you imagine that it. question landing on me? I uh, regardless, um, if I were to have an answer for that question, I, I think that would be very strange. So I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to say I don't know. I don't have an answer to that other than I don't think that should be a thing. Yeah, I, I really don't think that it should be either. And we should judge anybody who has done it. I judge you guys. <laughs> okay, good questions. Uh, what what do we see? Where do we see Pantheon going? What do we plan on getting done in 2024? Did you, you skip some questions there, yeah? What do we got in here? Ogre ETA, player emotes. Oh my God. Are you reading this? Yeah. Now see, I wasn't sure you were. All right. Oh, am I reading, it, was, was it said not to touch those? <laughs> no. I was, okay, because I'm not I just, reading like a shit. I wasn't, I wasn't sure that you actually read these, but it's, it's oh, nice yeah, to yeah. know. That, yeah, that's awesome. It's nice to know that you do. Okay, so. I am a shinobi. <laughs> you just don't leave any notes on it okay that's right that's, that's just to keep us guessing right of course <laughs> okay so ogre when when can we see it okay so it's it's coming along nicely uh it still needs to go through the rigging process and there's a few custom animations that we're doing for it because we want it to look ogre -y. 
Um, we are also finalizing right now the armor mesh kind of modification process that's going to allow us to use our armor models on the largest and smallest races as well. So basically how we're going to modify and, and augment those armor pieces to work um, with the largest and the smallest, which is why we're doing the Ogre now, the Gnome next. Um, so we're making steady progress on that. No exact ETA yet on when it's coming in, but the the good news is that once that process is finished for the Ogre and the Gnome, the two kind of extremes, the other races will be a significantly faster process um, because we won't need to do that armor modification, kind of working that out. Um, I, I'm confident. Um, I mean, I'm, it wouldn't be I wouldn't be me if I didn't say something that was going to give somebody a gray hair. So um, I, I feel pretty confident that we're going to be able to see most of the player races coming in this year. Um, that's just my from where I stand right now. Um, I feel like once this process is finished, that uh, we'll, we should be able to see that pretty. I'm pretty confident in that. So not making any any guarantees there, but that's just kind of my sense of things. It's, it's and I would say more so than for Rob, I probably just gave um, Bronson some gray hair there. Yeah, you can do it, Bronson. Don't worry about it. All right. So since since we're already already freaking people out. Um, so we're doing the ogre. We're doing the gnome. What's what's the next race after that? Next race after that will almost guaranteed be the halfling. Oh, sorry, guys. You don't get the scar yet. <sighs> and after that, we'll almost guaranteed be the elf to round out our King's Reach races. And then from then, I think it would be cool just to do like a community poll and, and see what people want to see next after that. I feel like the answer would be Scar. Yeah. Scar would see? be sick. I would love to see Scar get in. Yeah. yeah. All right, so player emotes, we have been missing them. Nobody can bow to me, which is a real, real awful thing to have happen in game. So when are we going to see those? You're so not used to that either, are you, Jamie? In real life, you've got it happening all the time. It's really yes. hard to acclimate to a game that... It is. In, in my world, people just bow when they talk to me. Okay. That's tough. That's so tough. I know. It's hard. So when can we see those? I'm still processing that a little bit. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> we are actually finishing up the first round of emotes right now, so those should be making their way in relatively soon. The first batch includes bow, formal bow, cheer, wave, clap, cry, point, thumbs up, nod yes, shake, head no. Those are the, uh, the first round of emotes that are coming in very soon. And dab. No, no dab. No dab? We do have the, the atomic dab. You guys know the okay. atomic dab? I don't. I don't. Can you I'm, demonstrate that for us? I'm going to need video of it. I can. You won't be able to see it, but I'll do it. That seems very unfair. Can, we, can you hear him moving, too? We can't see it, but we can totally hear it. No. <laughs> Did you actually do it, Joppa? No. Dang it. Okay, well... And by no, I mean yes. We can all imagine it in our imaginations. Joppa can be anything. Atomic dabbing, apparently. All right, so okay. let's see. I have the last question I have on here. Do you guys plan on evolving or changing the racial passives given the development changes through the years? Uh... It, to a degree, like in their, not so much like the categories of what the passes will be for each race, but the extent of the modifications or the way that they are modified, yes, I would say most likely you can expect some tweaks in how they're applied. But if, if a race is meant to have a bonus to daggers, for example, they would still have that bonus to daggers. It would just probably be expressed a little bit differently than the way we had worded it or intended it back when we first talked about it. Yeah, you guys are terrible people. There is not going to be a shart emote, I hope. I mean... 
No, right? That, that would be ridiculous, Joppa. <laughs> Dang it, Rob. No, no. I mean, some you just sometimes you just have to have the right emote to reach for, you know? I I would hate to <laughs> for the memes constrain people. <laughs> All right. Now we're done with those questions. Now can you tell us what is in store for Pantheon for 2024? So I already talked about one thing. I really want to see as many of our player races coming in and being playable as possible this year. I also would really love to see the rest of our base roster of classes coming online, meaning I want to see the Sumner, the Druid, the Ranger. Um, I want to see them online. I want to see them playable. And I, I would like to see all of the classes with their kits and having relatively, you know, relatively complete and, and dare I say somewhat polished um, gameplay for them. Uh, and I would love to see work begin on um, the Necromancer and the Bard as well. I, I spent a good amount of time talking with Phil from PVL about the Bard class um, and some of the things that he has up his sleeve for Bards and the way that their music and instrument system will work. And uh, it's pretty mind blowing. Um, it, it's pretty mind blowing. So, I'm excited about that. Um, I really want to see us get some more zones online. You know, throwing fast AVP, Hellenier Cave, obviously, but I'd like to see, um, you know, by the end of the year, thinking like year long, I would love to see, you know, some additional zones. I would love to see two or three, you know, more zones. Uh, I'd love to see Silent Plains and Eastern Plains and Black Rose Keep and them could actually connect it to Wild's End. I'd, I'd love to see that. Um, we'll be able to speak a little bit more candidly and precisely about, you know, what our actual projection looks like there um, as we get a little bit further into the year. But do expect us to start moving in the direction we talked about at the end of last year, uh, where instead of waiting for an entire zone to be complete before we bring it online, we're going to try to focus more on bringing portions of zones online at a time. You're going to see that happening with AVP, which is going to be coming out to you guys very, very soon here, where what, we, what we're calling the orange zone right now of AVP, which is a, a large but not complete portion of AVP will be coming online. Um, and then the, uh, the back half of the zone where the marbles are, um, and then uh, Hangor and Mad Run, those are additional portions of AVP which, which will be coming online um, later than this initial release. But we're going to try to start making those kinds of steps forward and releasing content and, and world building where we're getting portions of things out for testing and for playing um, instead of waiting. And then I, and then the rest of our game systems, like we, we need to get traits and dispositions in and more fully kind of incorporated into the NPC populations. We need to get our climates in place. We need to get the rest of our fractures the perception system and starting to get that woven in at least in its you know initial uh aspect the the discovery aspect of it um into our various zones and then events uh uh we have <laughs> one very specific event i'm thinking of that happens at night um that uh i would love to to see that among other things working this year as well so i could i could go on yeah like rob said swimming's a big one that we need to get in um it's going to be a big year for content, a really big year for content. Uh, I think that's probably our banner word for this year is uh, content, content, content. I, I thought we weren't giving a word to this year. We weren't until I did. Okay. Well, there you guys go. That's content. That's, I think it is much better than imminence, isn't it? <laughs> what are you talking about? Although, <laughs> that's a great word. It could also be read as content. So, I am not content with our content. <laughs> so, that could be a banner phrase. We're not content with our content. That's awesome. We're getting more content in. Can you tell us what's coming in the next update? Whew. Um, well, Persist will be fully in place. Our next update, I mean, it'll be in and expect to see uh, 
there have been insane improvements there just in terms of overall stability and it just feeling like the game is is functioning properly in terms of the data that it's meant to be saving and and all that so super excited about that um the avp and avp is so stinking close to like um being ready uh i i i am pushing for and I, I think everybody is of the same mind that you know whenever we do do this um uh next push that the initial um avp and it's an initial kind of orange zone would be available but i'm not going to say that 100 percent yet because uh there could be some things that i'm i'm missing or not remembering um but uh, i was just in there today and it's um I mean, it's basically there again. It's we're not we're not looking for perfection here. Like we, we want it to be at a point where it can be playable. Let's get in there, start playing it, give them feedback, all that stuff. So that's why I mean that I think we're at the point where we could probably roll that in. Um, so AVP is a big one. Um, all of the class updates that you guys were <laughs> expecting the last time we were about to push, um, you know, back early December, I guess it was. Uh, there were a lot of craft and gathering updates that are coming in as well. Um, We've got, uh, it's going to be meaty. It's going to be meaty. Do you have any TA on that? I have to ask. Rob, I'm so sorry. Oh, it, originally we were thinking that we would have AVP and some big content happening before the end of January. Are we still on track for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I think I said earlier, like we were originally, we, we were trying to hit uh, this weekend as getting something out the door um and then we we hadn't said anything about that because we weren't 100 percent sure yet and sure enough we we made the call today to hold off just a little bit longer because of a few things that we wanted to uh to address but i mean it, it is it is imminent um we're going to be trying to get it out as soon as possible hopefully hopefully next week maybe next weekend somewhere around there i mean stay tuned we'll we'll have a date as soon as we can Right. So you guys heard it here. Uh, word of the year is meaty. Well, it's both. It's it's content. It's meaty content. Both. It's both. And I, both. I so both. I <laughs> I had to go on Google and listen to that in all the different ways because I was like, how can I be wrong? Doesn't seem right. I can't be wrong. Don't think of it as a right or wrong thing. Just think of it as a normal and interesting humorous thing one of them is normal one of them is interesting and humorous i refuse to believe that i'm humorous all right I, th I think that that's all the questions is there anything else you want to share Joppa? uh anything else that i want to share my goodness yeah you you have you have an open mic and and 184 listeners more when they hear the video. So let's <laughs> let it flow. Again, sorry, Rob. There's not a sharding joke in there. I'm, I'm assuming. No, not today. No sharding today. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like when it's that open ended, I, I don't really I'm not really sure. Yes, the race class matrix. We did leave that one hanging, didn't we? Are we going to ignore that? I I wasn't allowed to update it. We're going to blame it on we're not going to blame it. But I'm just going to say that Joppa already threw all the hints that you guys could possibly need there. If you didn't pick it up, then you should just be ashamed of yourselves. Yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 the 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 bard and the necro moving more into view is is the hint there. Um, it's not that they're not. I think the, I think what's throwing people off is that those classes are already on the race class matrix. So it's like okay. Yeah, what, but they have the they have a little asterisk next to them. So if I went in like just remove that asterisk, what what would that tell you guys? Yeah. I think that that may be putting it into better view. 
And no, um, the Ranger is not last. So when I say core roster classes, I, I mean all of the classes except for the Necro and the Bard, since those historically have not been base roster guaranteed classes. But um, they are necessary for the uh, the class role, the the uh, class roles, and not having the majority of the crowd control burden falling on the Enchanter. Um, the Necro and the Bard gives us some really creative ways to handle crowd control in the form of a very selfish um, uh, support control slash DPS class and in the form of a incredibly robust support class in the Bard. Um, and uh, expect to be expect to be seeing more about like the actual you know breakdown of those classes, some examples of their abilities, and just kind of getting to know them a little bit better this year. Yeah, Redman, I'm just gonna say that possibly. No, okay. Necro is not jumping the Ranger. Um, no, the, that, yeah, no, I, I apologize, uh, if that's how it sounded. That's, yeah. That's some people way. took, some people took it that way. It was, there was tears, I think. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, that is not the case. Uh, Ranger is, is, uh, part of the base roster that'll be getting done before Necro and Bard come online. Okay. There you go. All right, can you guys be okay now? It's the ranger is not dead last. The pet system's coming along well. I don't know how many, I, I don't remember if I shared it. I guess I shared it just internally or to the VIPs. I don't, I don't think I shared it in the you, public channel. You shared, you shared a little video clip of a pet, a pet class. Yeah, so right now pets are working in the sense that you can summon a pet. Um, you can give that pet commands through chat line commands. Um, that pet will protect you. If you are attacked, it will attack what's attacking you. You can tell it to attack a target, tell it to stop, follow. Um, there are still the UI element to make there, and there are still some refinements to the pet system and some additional um, things we need to do for it to support things like Enchanter Charm and things like that. Um, and then the first pet class coming online, obviously, is going to be the summoner. And uh, the final concepting of the summoner Archimentals is uh, is in process right now. And in fact, the, the fire elemental has been approved, the fire Archimental, I should say, um, the which is called the Fury. The Titan, the Earth Archimental, is being concepted as we speak. Just saw a first draft of that today with, uh, with Bronson and got Brett our concept artist Brett working on those. Um, so as soon as those are done, those will go into the modeling process and um, the summoner is uh, is in the works. Oh, that's so sweet. I've, I've seen it asked a couple times, but can you tell us real quick, cross zone persistence, being able to move seamlessly across the zones, how's that looking? It's It's looking good in the sense that it is working. So you'll be able to move from Throne Fast into Avengers Pass seamlessly. There's some cleanup that we need to do. Like right now, once you do that, it there's a, an issue where it doubles up on chat messaging. So when you see a chat message, you're going to see like two of the same message. Um, it's just some, some minor cleanup things like that. Um, and then we also have, uh, uh, we need to put some more time into um, how NPCs themselves are going to be able to move across zone lines. So um, we're going to have to uh, give, you know, fair direction beforehand to say, hey, like, try not to abuse it. You know, don't sit right next to his own a tile line or his own line and, and just kind of run back and forth over there. You, you also, in this initial implementation, you'll be able to see into the other zone in terms of the environment, but you're not going to actually be able to see the NPCs on the other side of the zone even though you'll seamlessly cross over and then they'll appear, um, you won't be able to see uh, across the zone just yet. Yes, Rob, I can see your message. All right, so we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank, thank you, Rob. <laughs> Wait, what? Did you want to share something, Rob? <laughs> Are you messaging me somewhere else that I need to be aware of? I don't see any messages from you. 
<laughs> what what are you talking about? Oh, heck yeah. If, oh. You've, if you've got it, Rob, throw it in there. Yeah, drop it in. I don't think you actually have to ask, do you? I think that you can just do that, Rob. No, he does have to ask. He does, really? Oh, well, you have permission, Rob. Java gave you permission. Oh, well, it'll just take, it'll take Bronson forever to find it and put it in here. Do you got anything else, Ben? No, I do not. Although I, I thought that that, uh, that sticker from Oshag was, was, was the concept for a second. And I'm like, wait, that can't be it. Yeah, that's the Titan. Ah, oh, right. That's so cute. Yeah, go ahead and drop in the Fury, and then, I mean, you're fine to go ahead and drop in the, the Titan in progress. Just know that it's in progress, and there's already some tweaks being made to it. Dougbug, I don't know when this is going to be posted to YouTube. I, I have it recording, and then I will pass it off to Fire, who will put it up on YouTube probably sometime in the middle of the night since he's he's in Europe. So middle of the night in Europe or middle of the night on the West Coast? It's in the middle of the night in Europe right now, right? Mm, it is, yeah, it is 4 a.m. Where he's at, quarter after four. I assume he's sleeping. There we go. There's the fire elemental. It was so cute. That looks like it'll hurt things. All right, let's wrap it up. Anything else, Joppa? No, um, we took some some good inspiration from the EQ ele elementals with their uh, the the pre, I should say the pre um, art overhaul, uh, but. Um, loved the idea of them as like kind of just those flo floating torsos with with arms and so we took that a little bit further and uh wanted to give each one of them kind of a nice aesthetic unique aesthetic so all four including the zephyr and the and the undyne for the water and the air um similarly and then as our these are their base elemental forms but as archimentals for the summoner pets you'll actually see them with um some armor on them and the lowest level ones will not only be smaller in size, but they'll have minimal armor, probably just on their wrists at first. And then as you get higher level as a summoner and your pets become more powerful, your archimedals become more powerful, they'll become larger in size and then also be kitted out with more armor um, as they do. And the goal long term, which is why they have digits in their hands, is that they'd be able to equip certain items and weaponry as well, as well as having some cosmetic changes based on what they have equipped. So pretty excited about it yeah those look those look really good love those guys 